Hello and welcome to Inverted Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is lecture two where we try to answer the question, how do you describe a fossil specimen? Now, before I go into detail about how you systematically go about describing a fossil specimen, I want to talk a little bit about the philosophy of science and pay particular attention to how paleontology differs from other sciences. About 10 years ago, I got into a conversation with a woman scientist who worked in biotechnology. And she argued that paleontology was not a science because we didn't fo follow the modus tollonus, which is Latin for the method of denying, often known as the theory of falsification or rule of inference. Um, here's an example of, of that type of, uh, of logic. So if evolution is true, then we must find evidence of change in the fossil record. If we don't see a change in the fossil record that's observed, then evolution is disproven. Following modus tollotus, we come up with a hypothesis, and then we think of ways to disprove that hypothesis. So following modus tollotus, we come up with this hypothesis, and then we think of ways to disprove that hypothesis. And we can do that through a series of tests. Oftentimes you come up with a null hypothesis, and then you develop techniques to test that hypothesis. So a hypothesis then can only be raised to the level of a theory or a principle after many tests have been done um, that show that we can't disprove it with those th tests. So an idea is never, in fact, accepted. It's always sought to disprove it. However, paleontology sits in the more ancient realm of observational science. A science is based on making uh, as precise of measurements and descriptions of nature as possible. Um, paleontology can propose um, and test hypotheses, but often the science starts with direct observation. This is the science of the Italian Renaissance, where art and science mingled as people attempted to capture nature as accurately as possible, either in art or in science. So think of the duality of the Renaissance painters and scientists where there is little distinction between painting the Mona Lisa and diagramming the human body, often done by the same person. The discovery of a fossil is where paleontology begins. We don't question the reality of the fossil, but we set about to uncover the how and why the fossil exists in the first place. And we do that by describing the fossil in detail. Um, and drawing conclusions from that evidence that we gather. However, in describing a fossil, we also must be thinking about the importance of the fossil and the conclusions that we can draw from the fossil itself. Um, Charles Darwin once stated the following, which I think is a great quote. About 30 years ago, he said, there was much talk about geologists ought to only observe and not theorize. And I well remember someone saying that at this rate, one man might go into a gravel pit and count the pebbles and describe the colors of the pebbles he found. How odd it is that anyone should not see that all observations must be for or against some view if it's to be of any service. So even though paleontology is an observational science, it does not mean that it collects the arbitrary but it sets out to document the unusual, the unique, the missing evidence, or the piece of the puzzle to larger questions in science. So let's start with a new discovery, a new discovery of a fossil that you've just picked up out in the field. Maybe you're looking at a bunch of rocks and you just turn over a rock and see a beautiful fossil such as this trilobite. In this lecture I'm going to go, go over just how you go about describing the fossil and in the next series of lectures, we'll talk more about how you go about identifying the fossil, how to determine if the fossil represents a new species, how you can use the fossil to determine the past environment. Um, so today we're just going to focus um, our uh, lecture on how you go about describing the fossil. So first we'll talk about imaging the um, fossil specimen, and then we'll talk a little bit about the descriptive terminology you use to describe the specimen,
We'll talk about how you go about um, describing a fossil by using measurements. We'll talk about how you can actually get to diagram or reconstruct um, internal structures. And we'll talk a little bit about soft tissue reconstruction. So we're going to really be focusing on sort of the nuts and bolts of how you go about describing a fossil, uh, maybe one that you found or you're working on on a research project. So let's talk a little bit about how you go about imaging uh, fossil specimens. And I'm going to give you some tips on things that I've discovered that work really well when you um, set about photographing and sort of documenting a fossil that you've discovered. Uh, one of the interesting things is uh, early on you need to decide if you're going to have a white or black background to your image. So oftentimes to uh, focus your view on the fossil itself, the outer part that's not important, the background, is oftentimes either converted to um, black or to white, depending on the constraints of the journal. The Journal of Paleontology um, requires a black background, but other journals require a white background. Black backgrounds were, in the old days of photography, when you photographed a fossil specimen, they had basically overexpose or burn the surrounding areas around that fossil and it was a very meticulous process. Now it's super easy to do it in Photoshop. You can easily put in a layer and quickly go from either a white background, um, for example in this case, or you can go to back to a uh, black background and it's just put in a layer in either like Adobe Photoshop or one of the other uh, image processing software applications that are out there. So it's pretty easy to do this, and you can you can see how it really changes um, what you're looking at in terms of these fossils, the types of backgrounds you have. The other thing that you have to be concerned with when you're photographing fossils, um, oftentimes fossils are pretty small, and <clears throat> you have to worry about the depth of field. Um, many cameras, when you're, when you're focusing, will have a limited fo focus that they focus on. So if you look at this picture here, you can see that <clears throat> in the foreground um, it gets blurry and in the background it's blurry and there's a kind of a middle zone there where the lens is in focus. Um, you often have this uh, problem when you work in microscopes where you have something that projects out into the space. Um, this can happen with really big um, specimens as well if you're trying to photograph say a, a big skull of a dinosaur or something like that. Um, there'll be portions of it that are in focus and portions of it that are out of focus. So you have to figure out a way to deal with this. Um, and one of the ways that a lot of um, paleontologists deal with pho photography um, is to take numerous pictures and just change the focal depth. So here's kind of an example uh, where you have the foreground in focus and the background's out of focus. You then take that picture, you take the same picture, but now you have the foreground in focus, or I mean the background in focus and the foreground out of focus. And then you take those two uh, images and you stitch them together in Photoshop as different layers. And you use the background that's in focus and the foreground that's in focus and you get a nice sharp image. Um, and this is one of the ways you can do it manually, oftentimes using Photoshop and doing a number of layers. Um, <clears throat> nowadays, there's a number of software applications that allow you to do this, especially if you're photographing uh, things through a stereo microscope. Uh, there's software applications that allow you to stack these images very quickly. What the software does is it basically, you run through a bunch of focal depths, so you just change the focus on the microscope to go through all of those different layers, and so you go from the bottom to the top, make sure everything's in focus. And then you can enter it into um, some software that will go through and it will stack those. And so it will, uh, the software will identify parts that are in focus and parts that are out of focus and allow you to stack the image. And so the entire image is in focus. And you can see that with this example of a, um, the head of a fly. Um, so photographing really small specimens like this produce these really incredible images. So each of those layers is in focus. And you can take now, you know, usually it's like 20 images and you can stack those very quickly. <clears throat> the one thing you have to be careful of is when you do that focal change going through, you can't adjust or move anything. So everything has to be still as you're going through those focal things because if it shifts or change positions, it'll just create a blurry image. So that's one of the tricks to do it. So you can do it manually, 
uh, using Photoshop uh, various stacks or you can use some of these software applications and they're getting better at being able to produce some really nice images um, you can actually use these to get um, stereo uh, images and that is that you can get ones that are just corrected just enough that you can actually get a 3D image if you stare at the two two different uh, pictures and you can do that for publications as well. One of the, the biggest challenges I think with paleontology and photographing uh, specimens is dealing with the, the nature of the fossil that you're describing. Um, this is an example from one of my research papers and this is a little uh, mammal jaw fossil. You can see it's really small, it's a head of a pin there, uh, so it's, it's very very teeny, it's a teeny fossil, that scale bar is uh, one millimeter. So the problem I have is that if you photograph this um, just through a microscope, you get a lot of reflection. And because the fossil is black, and a lot of fossils are black, it tends to um, re basically absorb any of the light that you, that you shine on it. And, and then it tends to be kind of shiny, so you get that shiny part that flashes back. So you can't see the real detail of the specimen. So what um, paleontologists tend to do is they take the specimen and they coat it in some sort of white um, uh, powder of some sort so that when the photograph is taken it, uh, it basically reflects that light back into the camera lens and you get a cleaner uh, picture or image of that fossil. So you can see uh, the top image is one that I didn't cover and just used a microscope to photograph and the bottom one is a uh, the specimen where I've coated it in a white coating and, um, and then photographed it. Um, there's different ways to apply this coating. Um, if you're dealing with a bigger specimen, this might be a, a better setup, and that's using ammonia chloride. Uh, ammonia chloride you put into a, um, a vial, and then you can heat it up over a, a burner, and that produces um, this white powder that comes out. If you want to do this in a, under a film hood, um, so that white powder that comes out, you don't breathe it in because ammonia chloride is poisonous. Um, another technique that I use if you're dealing with smaller specimens is using uh, magnesium uh, strips. And you can um, take a match and light it, and it produces a smoke that's magnesium oxide, which is very white, and you can quickly cover the specimen. Now this white coating on the specimen can be wiped off, it doesn't. It just kind of lightly dusts the specimen, and you don't want to put too much on it because if you put too much, it'll start to glob up and it'll obscure any of the features that you want to highlight. So here's kind of another example um, of a specimen just photographed without a white coating, and then with the white and whiting added to uh, to the specimen. Here's an invertebrate. So one of the really neat things about this is that um, you can actually reveal a lot of um, features in the fossil that you wouldn't necessarily have revealed if you just photographed it straight. Um, so it's a great technique. Um, and it's easy and inexpensive to do. One of the other things you can think about doing is high resolution photographs. So when we talk about high resolution photographs, we can talk about really big, large uh, uh, files. But mostly what we're talking about is using um, SEM photography. So SEM stands for Scanning Electron Microsop mic Microscope. So SEM is um, a specialized microscope that basically can photograph um, a specimen. And they're really good for specimens that are below about 5 millimeters. Although I've seen larger specimens up to like 15 or 20 millimeters. So that's like 2 or 3 centimeters uh, is kind of the maximum size. You have to kind of stitch the images together. Now how a SEM basically works uh, is that um, electron beam shoots out little electrons and electrons go down through um, they are focused onto the specimen and then they bounce off the specimen and then um, those electrons are picked up by a detector and using that detector they can reconstruct where those electrons bounced off so it's not light uh, it's actually uh, these electrons so you can go at a very very small scale there's a couple problems with scanning electron microscopes um, in the old days, in the older scanning electron microscopes, you had to coat everything in gold. Um, and the reason for that was that the gold would basically bounce off the electrons. It's a metal. The problem was is that a lot of museums didn't want this gold applied to um, these teeny little specimens. 
um, and it's kind of expensive, it's a pain, it's kind of destructive to the, fo to the fossil. Um, nowadays, a lot of SEMs are what are called S environmental SEMs, and they allow you to do SEMs on specimens that um, don't have a coating. And a lot of this was developed with um, the problem of dealing with wet specimens. So a lot of biologists use specimens that are wet, and they can't dry them out and apply a coating, a gold coating. So they use these environmental SEMs, and they do pretty good. Um, the quality is not as high as the gold-plated ones, but they're really good. Um, and here at USU, we have a new SEM laboratory um, where we can do some of these uh, SEM images. It's a, big, it's a big process doing one of these images because you have this big, huge tube. You don't, it's not like a traditional microscope that you can look through a lens. You actually put it into a platform, uh, shoot the electrons at it, and then the screen pops up your, your, your specimen, whether you got it or not. So, um, so it's kind of a new tool, and it produces fantastic, wonderful, wonderful images of these things. So one of the things you need to worry about lighting the, um, the fossil properly um, one of the biggest problems you have is that um, getting light to go into all the cracks and crevices of the fossil that you're trying to photograph. Oftentimes, one of the biggest problems with fossils, I think, is they're not very photogenic. <laughs> and so sitting down and really spending time directing your lights is really important. So there's different ways you can set up a studio to photograph your fossils. Um, and that is to have a number of different light sources. Another thing that you can use is aluminum foil to basically um, put that aluminum foil in certain places that you want to highlight in the fossil. And so this way you can get into those cracks and crevices of the fossil to photograph and um, spend a lot of time and playing around with the lighting, taking lots of different pictures at different orientations and spending a lot of time. Uh, one of the really nice things you can do is invest in one of these um, flexible sort of light light uh, uh, projections on here. Let's see if I have this plugged in. No, I don't. But it basically will have little lights that you can really, you know, put around a fossil and spend some time uh, directing the light in certain places. And so these little uh, uh, lamps are really helpful for doing that sort of stuff. So spend time with light. And um, I want to show you like a really good specimen um, with some excellent lighting. Here it is a fossil, a fossil shell where we have excellent light applied to the fossil. You can see that none of the fossil is in shadow or in darkness. So you don't see a really strong contrast. You can make out the features from one side of the specimen to another side of the specimen. You can see that the entire specimen's in focus. Uh, and so this is a really good image that you can use for a publication and really share with other scientists. So this is the type of image that you want to do. The one downside is this image doesn't have a scale bar. And so one of the things you oftentimes want to put into an image that you're taking of a, of a particular fossil specimen is a scale bar. And then you can send this to lots of people and share this information. And it's very important because it really shows and captures the specimen. It's not out of focus. It's not in shadow. It's just a really good image that you've taken. So besides taking images, one of the important things is to learn the terminology of the fossil specimens that you're working with. Throughout the semester, we're going to be talking about a lot of arcane terminology that's used for various fossil groups. Um, here I have some um, trilobites, for example. And so we're going to learn about what Echabella is. And so you can use that in describing fossils. And one of the things that you discover is as you go into a particular group of fossils, you have to learn all this new terminology. The terminology is really important because without this terminology, you know, people might call it the nose or maybe the eyes or maybe, you know, this, it's actually the stomach. We'll learn about that, trilobites. So people call it different things trying to equate it to humans and it, none of it makes any sense. So they need to come up with new terms. And this drives students crazy because there's hundreds and thousands of new terms to use in describing fossils. So you just have to learn these terms. But once you learn them, then you can communicate uh, with other scientists very effectively. They know what you mean when you say it's the gabella is 
very large or very small, they know exactly what you mean. Uh, and so it, you develop an, a language to communicate with other scientists. So descriptive terminology is a pain. We're going to learn a lot of it uh, and go through a lot of these terms, but it's necessary for doing science. The other thing you need to do is take lots of measurements. And I mentioned putting a scale bar in your uh, in your uh, images when you take an image of a, of a fossil. Uh, but the other thing you can do is just take lots of measurements. Uh, length, width, the radius, the area, the circumference. A lot of people, a lot of paleontologists carry around calipers. So whenever they go into a museum collection, they can sit down and begin measuring uh, different sizes of things in collecting data and generating data. One of the fields of science that deals with measuring and measuring specimens is morphometrics. Morpho meaning shape, metrics meaning sort of math or numbers, so it's basically the numbers of shapes. And there's different techniques you can do. One of the things I'll talk a little bit about is foreigner analysis, or also known as harmonic analysis. Um, so for example, what you do is you pick particular landmarks on a, on a specimen that you're comparing and then you can use those landmarks to take uh, readings in sort of a what they call morpho space which is basically the three-dimensional space of where those dots occupy. You then can compare that with many many specimens and this is called morphometrics and there's lots of science, lots of paleontologists that do this measuring lots and lots of points on specimens. Now this may seem like kind of overkill, you just want to know the length and width and things like that, but sometimes it can be really important and here's a good example of why you might use foreigner uh, analysis on a bunch of specimens. So here we have some, di um, actually some forams and You'll notice that each of these forams that are in this graph here, um, if you were to measure them, they're basically all the same size. So if you measured the circumference or you measured the width and you know length, they're all about the same size, and so they would all group together. However, they have different shapes. You know, one of them is more round and circular. One has these like little spheres coming off of it. So one of the things you want to do with with these types of analysis, like foreigner uh, analysis, is basically outlining those shapes. And by outlining those shapes, you can move from, say, completely sphe a sphere, which has a um, a radial analysis of one, so the radius value is one, or you can have one that's very bumpy and have an amplitude that's that's less than one, and be like something that's that's much smaller, like. 0.1. So you have variation in that radius across there. So these are ways to sort of quantify the bumpiness using numbers to get at the shape and use this to identify different species or maybe growth series or maybe different dimensions. Um, oftentimes this is important also to figure out distortion that can happen in the fossil record as well. So um, there's a lot of tools that you can use to use morphometrics. Uh, one of the tools that's often used is what's called a microscribe. So a microscribe is like this little arm that you attach to a computer. And the computer basically records wherever that point of that arm is. That's kind of, hold, he's holding it like a pencil there in that diagram. So a microscribe, he can move that point around the specimen and it records the 3D coordinates so the x, the y, and the z coordinates of those positions as he moves it around the specimen. So then you can take lots of points like this and it captures it into the computer and then it can generate the shape of that fossil. Another thing that's being used more and more is 3D laser scanners. So here we have a fossil that's um, on a little turntable and then there's that blue thing there with the tower which is actually a scanner and so the turntable will turn very slowly and the scanner will actually scan the surface of it. And what it's doing is it's sending out the laser beam, um, hitting the, the specimen and then bouncing back into um, and registering it. And it registers that distance. So lasers are really good at figuring out the exact precise distance away. And so then it takes that information, puts it into the computer as well as the rotation, and you can reconstruct a very nice replica with lots of numbers, so that's going to be distance numbers to that specimen and reconstruct it in a computer in a similar fashion. You don't have to hit all the different points. And this might be a really good way of capturing some data on something that may be irregular, so in this case it's a fossil coral.
Now, I've talked about images um, and the importance of images and taking great images and capturing numbers and all these things, but I wanted to talk a little bit about Gerat Vermeji, who is um, the world's expert on fossil shells. Um, he's published extensively on fossil shells. In fact, we'll probably read some of his papers. Uh, brilliant scientist, has done incredible work on mollusks, um, published lots of papers, the world's expert on mollusks, and he's blind. And one of the things that makes him such a great scientist is that he uses his other senses. He uses his hands and feels the different ridges on these fossils, on the textures of the shells. He's able to encapsulate with his own mind the feeling, the dimensions, the shape, the feel of the fossils. And that allows him to approach fossils in a very different way than many other people who rely on our eyes to see what we're seeing. And I think this um, is a really good example of how paleontology needs to use all of our senses when we describe um, a fossil and a specimen. So even describing the ridges, the roughness, the textures, and reconstructing those things is really important. And we shouldn't get bogged down too much on images. So I'll be reading some papers of his probably when we start covering mollusks. Um, and uh, it's just a really incredible story, and he's a, he's a great scientist. One of the things that's been happening um, recently is uh, our ability to image the interior portions of fossils and get a view inside fossils, even taking uh, fossils that are unprepared, putting them into x-rays, and basically trying to reconstruct the interior. In the old days, you would oftentimes take a, a fossil and you would put it into um, underneath an x-ray, trying to x-ray on it, and sometimes you could reveal the internal anatomy of the fossil beneath the rock in an x-ray. Now it's because of the dis different densities of the fossil um, from the matrix around the fossil. Um, people quickly discovered that you can actually just throw these into a CT scanning uh, equipment. A CT scanner basically um, takes x-rays at slices through something, and so XT, or CT scanning is often done in the medical profession and takes x-rays of slices so they can take slices through the body and people started throwing uh, fossils onto CT scans and getting these slices. Uh, you can take these slices, these x-ray slices, and then stitch them together to create a 3D image. But you can also go in and look at the interior structure inside the fossils. Um, in the last few, probably, 15 years, uh, micro CT scanning has become uh, a new tool. Micro CT scanning is a little bit than traditional CT scanning in that it's much smaller. So they can do very small specimens. So in the old days, you could do this with dinosaurs, maybe some large mammal fossils, things like that that were, you know, human size. But now people are putting really small fossils underneath uh, these micro CT scanning uh, machines and able to take slices and put, stitch those slices together. What's cool about CT scanning is that we can reconstruct the interior portions of uh, these fossils. So here's a really kind of cool example. This is a shark's tooth, and they CT scanned the shark tooth. So they took lots of layers, and you can see some of the individual layers down below. And then they took those and they stitched them together to make a 3D image based on the um, shape of that tooth. But they also could then go in and highlight those cavities inside the tooth and then the computer, the software can recognize the, that um, where it's not opaque and then get rid of the hard parts around it and so you reconstruct the internal blood cavities that invaginated that tooth and applied the blood for that tooth so these are the arteries and veins <coughs> that fed that tooth and you can reconstruct those. This is a really powerful tool because you can do some really cool soft tissue reconstruction. I'm going to post um, on our class website some of the really cool uh, new micro CT scanning examples of some of these specimens you can play around with in three dimensions. If you've enjoyed what you've seen today and would like to take a class at Utah State University, check out our department website at geology.usu.edu. If you're interested in my own research and who I am, check out my website at benjaminslashberger.org.